Good morning, everyone. My name is Glenn Wildey with Top Grade Ag. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me this morning for part four of our webinar series, The Future is Bright for In-Bin Grain Drying. Um, today's uh, webinar is on supplemental heating and fuel selection for in-bin drying. Uh, over the past three webinars, we've uh, we've covered, basically broke down all the components of an in-bin drying system, and we've covered uh, our, our, our ambient air, um, the impact of fan selection, air delivery systems, friction um, of air flowing through grain, and and the impact of, of, of vent losses. And, and the last component that we're looking at today is, is supplemental heat. Um, ultimately, if, if you really truly want to, to consider your in-bin uh, system as an in-bin drying system, supplemental heat is, is, is a necessity. Um, if you are relying on mother nature to dry your grain, it really isn't a grain drying system. So, um, so supplemental heat is, is, is something that, that really is key to, to giving you a predictable and, and dependable on-farm grain drying. Um, during today's webinar, uh, I'm gonna be covering three, three topics. The first topic will be risks associated with, with adding supplemental heat to your, to your grain mass. Uh, the second topic will be looking at the different types of uh, supplemental heaters and and a review of, of their thermodynamic efficiency. So, so how efficiently can these heaters add, um, basically take BTUs from your fuel and, and put it into the grain? And, and the third portion, we'll be looking at the various types of fuel and the impacts that that fuel has on your, your final in-bin drying costs. Risks associated with supplemental heat. Uh, the, the first and the, and, and the you know, the fairly common is, is structural damage to your grain bin. You, you can see here in this, uh, in this photo, the, the bottom panel is, is wrinkled and, and this is really quite common. It, uh, it typically happens in the older bins uh, where they don't have the wall stiffeners and in many instances, the, um, the, the, the sidewall uh, is, is a lower uh, thickness of steel. So, so it, it just tends to uh, uh, become an issue when you're adding heat and, and accelerating the drying process. The, the good thing is stiffeners can be added for reasonable cost. Um, I know some some farmers will actually add uh, heavier steel uh, rings to, the, to just above their hopper, but uh, but it's something to keep in mind it, when you are choosing your 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 drying bins. Um, I would I would tend to stay away from the older bins and and stick with with your modern bins with with stiffeners, uh, just to ensure that that you're not gonna gonna end up uh, doing damage. Condensation is a is a, a very common issue. Um, it's it's something that you really can't uh, avoid. It, it happens anytime the ambient air temp is below the attic air dew point temp. And, and uh, simply put, it, it typically happens when your ambient temperatures are below zero. And um, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar, essentially the, 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 the warm, humid air hits the, the, the bin roof and it uh, essentially starts to rain in your bin. And you can see that that significantly impacts your efficiencies and uh, because you basically are recycling water in your bin. One of the solutions is a roof exhaust fan. This, this does work well. The key with the roof exhaust fan is make sure it's sized properly. The, the theory behind this is that you need your roof fan to move more air than your aeration fan. And ultimately what happens is that roof fan will bring additional cold air into the attic through your roof vents and it mixes with that warm, humid air and it reduces the dew point and eliminates the, uh, the condensation. But it's very important that it's sized properly. A second option is to actually raise the roof panels and allow water to drip outside the bin instead of inside the bin. Um, I was uh, I was actually uh, uh, told uh, 
informed about this option by one of our uh, customers and he actually has a, a stirring bin, a 5,000 bushel stirring bin, and he had a roof exhaust fan, but he claimed it, it didn't do the job. And, uh, and he raised the roof panels and he said it completely eliminated the issue. Um, it uh, essentially, the water doesn't contact the side walls and instead it just, it just slides uh, down the roof panels and, and drops outside the bin. So that's that's a novel, uh, a simple fix. Um, as far as op costs go, it's a little tricky to actually execute raising the roof, but but it is a it is a, a nice option. The third uh, option is is to simply avoid drying during cold weather. Now, in order to do that, um, the, the the key is to be very aggressive and and try to move your harvest window um, earlier in the season. So so ultimately, the, the idea would be to take your, your, your crop as early as possible and, and, and push the, uh, the, uh, the harvest into September so that you're not drying uh, late in the season. Um, worst case, if it does get late in the season, you can uh, turn off your fan and heater during the cold nights, but that, to a certain extent, that defeats the purpose. Um, our IBD monitor does, does provide a, uh, a, an alert warning when condensation is at risk, um, and uh, and that is it's it's a nice thing to have. But but in in the real big picture, if you want to use your grain bins as as your go-to dryer, you you want to be able to dry during during all weather conditions. Uh, the number three risk is fire. Um, ultimately, the the uh, it, in bin drying is probably one of the, the safest methods of, of drying uh, grain. Um, the one the one exception would be the uh, the inline uh, heaters. Uh, it's just a simple fact that chaff and open flames don't mix. And uh, here here's a a picture of of what you can expect accumulating in your in your aeration tubes or or in your open uh, full floor aeration. Uh, chaff will fall through um, and and either uh, you really have to make an effort to to make sure that you you clean this out um, or uh, or I think it's a good idea to avoid the the open flames um, in combination with this uh, as noted most most furnace type and hydronic heaters where where the combustion chamber is completely independent of your aeration air, uh, they are very low risk and, and uh, have, have virtually uh, zero risk of, of fire uh, as related to impacting your grain bin. Uh, number four is heat damage. And, and what I'm uh, referring to is, is basically damaging your grain. If, if you um, are adding too much heat, you will reduce your, um, your bushel weights, you will reduce your germ. And uh, it's very important to have thermostatic control you want to uh, be able to set uh, the maximum temperature going into your bins just to ensure that uh, that you prevent any damage to the grain. And in the event that you're you're adding this supplemental heat to uh, upstream of a of an inline uh, a fan, you you also want to prevent overheating that fan motor because uh, you you can do damage to your fan if if you are uh, putting excess heat. One thing that thermostatic control does not do is, is actually improve your in-bin drying efficiency. Um, ultimately, you have a certain amount of water that you need to evaporate in your bin. And um, the, the rate that you add that, uh, that heat uh, doesn't really matter. The, the faster you add it, the, uh, the quicker you will dry the grain. But, but the problem is, is that you will will damage the grain if you are adding heat uh, too quickly. Another note uh, that regarding the heat damage is that um, just like when you're binning grain on a hot day at 30 or 35 degrees, if you want to store this long term, you really have to cool it. Um, your germ will drop if, if you store grain at, at high temps and cola, uh, canola, can actually heat if if you uh, if it is binned at 30 degrees. So you want to go through the cooling uh, 
process the same as you would with any other bin and, and it's it's very important to, to remember that. Uh, grain stands up or, or basically it loses its flowability is, is a, an issue that is is caused when when grain, specifically canola, is binned at extreme moistures. Here's an example of uh, canola that was binned at about 18 or 19 percent moisture and 8 percent green and uh, this photo was taken uh, when it was being moved at about 12 percent so it had been dried uh, around six points but but you can see that the flowability is is drastically reduced and um, and, and that can be a huge huge hindrance um, we really recommend a two-step drying process if if you're dealing with these types of uh, uh, moisture contents and turn the entire bin after you've dried it half ways. Um, ultimately, if, if you're dealing with you know 18 uh, to 20 percent moisture canola, I would I would highly recommend doing it in smaller batches and and increasing your air flows so that you uh, you actually will will dry it down in in a shorter period of time. And it, and it prevents uh, this type of an issue. The, the last uh, risk that, uh, that, that really comes with adding supplemental heat is uh, the risk of restricting your airflow. Now, now, this isn't necessarily an issue when you have a heater downstream of your fan. It's it, typically you're, you're going to have a, a, a 0.2 or 0.3 inch uh, uh, pressure drop, which, which isn't huge. On the downstream, but where it is a very big issue is on the upstream side. So when you are restricting the air inlet, um, fans have uh, are, are very sensitive to any type of restriction. What uh, j just to give you a feel for for what sort of vacuum a, a typical aeration fan is capable of of, of pulling. Um, we did a, a little test with one of our, our rads that had louvers and um, we uh, first we, we ran it with the louvers wide open and, uh, and, and the rad nice and clean and we, uh, we took our, our uh, static pressure readings with, with a manometer, electrical, uh, elect, digital manometer and uh, between the rad and the fan we found 0 0.02 inches of water column which is a, a very low vacuum. Um, now what we did just to see uh, what happens when you restrict the flow is we closed all these louvers and, and we took our reading again and, uh, and that came out at a quarter inch of, of vacuum. So, so what you can take from that is, is ultimately uh, an aeration fan. Again, this is, this is just one, one test with, with one three horse turbo fan. But that specific fan was able to pull a quarter inch vacuum with, with very little airflow. Um, so, so that is an absolute worst case scenario that you want to stay away from. You, when you are testing, and I, I suggest you do get a manometer and you test uh, upstream of your fans if you have a heater, you should be in this 0 0.01 inch uh, vacuum range is, is, a, is a, a good place to be. Um, so that's just, just sort of a, 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 a on farm. Uh, I guess uh, exper or, or, uh, exercise you can do uh, to, to give you confidence. Um, here, here's a second uh, example of, of, of how sensitive uh, a restriction on the inlet can be. This was a, one of our customers. Um, they had the, uh, the flag road type heater and, and they were using a sock and, and they had connected it in this manner, which I, I felt wasn't uh, going to be a, a huge issue as far as restriction. They they had uh, airflow uh, an airflow gauge on their fan and and he, with the sock installed you can see they had seven inches of uh, of water column uh, back pressure on their fan and and based on the gauge it showed about 3,000 cfm uh, approximately which which is a good good volume of airflow and and uh, and that was what they were basing their drying event on but for curiosity they removed the the sock and. Uh, and what they found was the uh, the actual static pressure jumped from seven to eight inches on the discharge, and the airflow dropped down to 1600 by removing that sock, and um, and and that is just really confusing. How how you know what what does all this data mean? And uh, and ultimately, I want to walk through 
um, the gauge and how this gauge works here, just to, to give you a feel for what we can actually learn here. Um, number one, when the sock is removed, your, your gauge is reading static pressure. Static pressure is always a good data point. It's always real. Now, on an airflow gauge, uh, like the Wildy airflow gauge, this scale is basically a fan curve. It's the manufacturer's fan curve that is printed on this gauge face. And the manufacturer's fan curve is based on uh, the fan's performance running with no obstruction and with uh, a, a, a mechanically sound uh, uh, fan. So ultimately, when the sock is removed and we have no obstruction, this scale should read accurately. Um, so we can believe this 1600 CFM. So that is the actual airflow with no sock and with eight inches of, of, of back pressure caused by friction. Now, when we come back to the, the sock installed, and, uh, and we know that we have an obstruction as small as we feel it to be, we know that this uh, fan curve is completely meaningless on, on this gauge because we are obstructing our airflow. So, so don't pay any attention. This airflow is incorrect, the 3000, but this static pressure is accurate. So we are at seven inches of static pressure with the sock installed. We are at eight inches when it's removed. Now, how does that, what can we learn from that? Well, basically, when the air is flowing through the grain, we are developing this eight inches of static pressure. And that pressure is created by air flowing through our air delivery system, friction through our grain, and friction out of our vent. And that air path is identical whether we have the sock on or whether we have the sock removed. The only thing that could possibly result in more friction is more airflow. So you can conclude that because you have eight inches of static pressure with the sock removed and only seven inches with the sock installed, you actually have to have less airflow when the sock is installed. And because we know that we have 1600 CFM, when the sock is removed, we have to have less than 1600 CFM in this instance. So ultimately, you can see how this gauge is very deceptive if you have an obstruction and it's very much recommended to fill your bin with the sock or with, without the obstruction so you know what your airflow is, add the obstruction and see how it impacts your airflow so that you know um, what the real airflow is. That summarizes uh, basically the risks uh, associated with adding supplemental heat. And, and the next item that I want to look at is, is basically step through the different types of, uh, of supplemental heaters and, and what their efficiencies, uh, therm thermodynamic efficiencies are and how they compare. Um, when we get into efficiency, really, um, heat transfer is all about transferring heat from a hot body to a cold body and um and 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 the higher the temperature difference of these two the more btus we're going to transfer now we want this heat transfer to be useful ultimately we want to transfer as much heat from from the hot uh, source to the grain as possible and we want to minimize wasted btus that we transfer to the environment. Um, so ultimately, um, when, when we're looking at efficiency, we want to minimize waste. And, and the first fan, uh, the first heater that we're going to look at is the inline heater. Um, very commonly, it's a direct flame inline heater. Here's a schematic basically showing that, that the combustion chamber and the airflow are all in the same uh, airspace. So you have your, your cold air entering the aeration system, you have your flame, your, your fuel is injected, you have combustion and all your exhaust gases and air all exit and enter your, your grain bin. 
There also is a, an electric version of this where the air passes over an element and uh, again, you, uh, your, your warm air enters your, uh, your, your grain mass. Now, the, the beauty of this system is you have 100% useful BTUs. So, so you have zero uh, amount of, of heat that is uh, wasted on the environment. But the ultimately the, 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 the overriding um, issue with this system is the fact that there is vapor from combustion added to the heat. And that's where um, the, the term wet heat versus dry heat comes from. And, and wet heat is, is referring to this type of heater because you're adding vapor to your, uh, your warm air. Now, what I wanna do is try and quantify how much water are we actually adding and how does it impact the, the, the thermodynamic efficiency. Um, so what, what I've calculated here is, is the amount of water that is, uh, is, is generated when you combust 100,000 BTUs of, of liquefied propane is about 0.9 gallons. So, um, and the reason I use the 100,000 BTUs is, is that's, it's a nice divisible number for one, but also it is the type of um, heat that you would very typically uh, have on a, on a three to 5,000 bushel bin. 100,000 BTU per hour heater is, 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 a, is a good uh, amount of BTUs to, to have on your, your system. So, so LPG, you get about 0.9 gallons per 100,000 BTU and natural gas, you get 0.7. So natural gas is a little bit drier, um, but, uh, but that lets you know how much water are you adding to your, to your airstream. Now, in order to convert that to some sort of an efficiency, what, what we have found with, uh, with our IBD monitor is that 100,000 BTUs of heat can on, on a typical bin um, get about four gallons of water per hour of water removal. So you get about four gallons per 100,000 BTU. Now, th these, these tests were done with dry heat. So what I wanna do is I wanna compare um, these efficiencies. So if you have an LPG 100,000 BTU heater, um, but uh, normally, it should be able to take out about four gallons, but we're adding 0.9 gallons. So the net F effect is you've got 3.1 gallons of water removed only out of the four. So you would downgrade that to about a 77.5% efficiency for, for liquefied propane. Now, if you went to natural gas, your efficiency is about 82.5%. But you can see that, that this actually is not that big of an issue as far as efficiency goes because 80% plus or minus is respectable. And, um, and, and ultimately, you know, the whole idea behind wet heat maybe isn't as big an issue as, as you might have thought. Um, I, I want to say these are all very approximate numbers, but directionally, um, I, I think it is a, a valid sort of analysis. Here is an example of a, an inline heater. This is uh, a, a, on the inlet of a, a low speed centrifugal fan. Um, you, you can see this has uh, the, uh, the regulator. So you're basically adding your propane or your natural gas uh, right on the inlet of your fan. Um, ultimately, you wanna be very aware of, of any restriction here again, because that, that will uh, reduce, your, um, reduce your fan uh, uh, performance. Here's a second uh, version of an inline. This is downstream of the actual fan. So, so I do prefer that in that it, it has a, a less uh, significant impact on your air flows. But, but in, this is a really good um, uh, picture. You can see the open flame. Um, it's connected right to that, uh, that transition. And you, you can see how, how you have to be very careful of um, of, of making sure that your, your aeration ducting is clean and, and you almost have to inspect it every year as, as rodents will uh, you know build nests in, in the most opportune places 
and, and it can create a, a very high uh, uh, fire risk. Um, the second supplemental heater that we're, we're looking at is a furnace type. And uh, with this, you, you basically have an independent combustion chamber. So your, your air going to your aeration bin is completely separate from the combustion process. Um, you have an air fuel mixture that is, uh, is combusting and, and the exhaust gases exit without um, any uh, vapor of con combustion uh, entering the airstream. Um, the, the one thing with this is that you typically have very high uh, air velocities, so it is more difficult to get good efficiency. Um, because the air is moving so fast, you have a very short time to, to, to take those BTUs out of your combustion. Um, as a result, typically your, your uh, furnace type heaters would, would have a, a useful BTU efficiency about 60 to 80 percent, which means you're, you're, you're wasting 20 to 40 percent of your, your BTUs and, uh, and, and warming your environment. The, uh, a real rough uh, rule of thumb uh, the exhaust stack temp is is the, uh, the the kind of the key to to a good efficient heater and and you don't want excessive exhaust gas temps. Uh, the more passes your heater has, the more heat you'll extract and, and the lower temp your exhausts will be. Um, and, and generally speaking, um, if you have an efficient heater, when you're standing beside it, you shouldn't feel the radiant heat coming off it. Um, but but again, um, 40, uh, or sorry, 60 to 80 percent efficiency is is probably something that you would expect. Um, here here are, are some options for the furnace type heaters. I don't actually have any um, efficiency ratings for these. Um, I couldn't track them down. All this information I just got off the internet. But uh, here's a Go Technologies heater. It's uh, you'll, you'll notice that the 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 combustion chamber is downstream of the fan, which which I like. You have no obstruction on this fan, uh, free entry. Here's your, your stack, providing a exhaust of all your, your vapors and, and exhaust uh, uh, byproducts, and, and you have just the warm air entering your bin. Uh, second uh, type is the Flagro uh, industrial heater. This is a very common heater. Um, this one is, uh, uh, on the inlet of your fan, so I would I, I would uh, encourage you to to pay attention to to your your uh, your pressure drop and and whether or not you have a significant vacuum on the inlet of your fan. Um, obviously, if this is sized properly, if you have a big enough uh, a fan here to provide positive pressure, it shouldn't be an issue. But but it it really is something that you want to be aware of. Um, these, uh, these, all, all the heaters that I've noted have thermostatic controls, which is, which is a, a necessity. You really want to control uh, the heat that you're putting onto this motor and onto the grain. Here's the third uh, heater uh, furnace type. It's an aromatic. Uh, I've heard real good reviews from farmers on this heater. Um, again, this, the same, same uh, sort of uh, cautions. Don't starve your fan. Um, make sure that uh, that 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 you're not restricting airflow because uh, it it is a huge. Um, it really completely eliminates your drying eff effectiveness if you don't have airflow, even if you're adding BTUs. So so this is uh, the the third type of furnace uh, uh, heater. Now the the hydronic type heater is. Uh, is, is generally speaking, it's the most efficient, and, and the main reason for that is because water heaters, um, the velocity of your water going through um, the heat exchanger is, is significantly lower than, than the velocity of your air. So, so these water heaters will generally pick up a higher percentage of the BTUs uh, from, from the flame, and as a result, you will get a higher efficiency in, in your water heater, but but Taking some of that efficiency way, away is the fact that this is a part two. Uh, there's a, a second uh, part to this system, and that's the radiator. Now, you will lose some energy uh, from your hoses and your rad, but, but 
the, the key here is that it is relatively small losses because typically you would run this uh, water system at 30 to 40 degrees Celsius. And, and at that low of a temperature, the, the Delta T is, is not that high. So the BTU losses are relatively low. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, the, the, the losses uh, in, a, in a firebox or, or where, where you're in the, the hundreds of degrees C, you, you lose a lot more heat to, um, to the environment. Generally speaking, again, the, these aren't um, uh, laboratory uh, results, but, but I, would, I would say that you're going to be looking at a 70 to 80 percent uh, useful BTU um, for a hydronic system, so maybe a 10% gain um, the, of, of the useful BTUs getting to your grain mass. And, and so then you've got about 20 to 30% wasted um, going to the, uh, the environment. Here is the, uh, the first example of a hydronic heater. It's a dry air system. This, this, this has been in the ag industry for, for many years. Um, this is a, a, an example of a, of a large, uh, uh, heating system for likely in the in the million to two million BTU range and it's for a, a very big bin yard. The, the nice thing about the, the hydronic system and this type of setup is that you have a single point for your fuel consumption. So if you are burning natural gas, you, you can plumb in a single point uh, and you consume all your fuel at one location and then you, you, you basically distribute the heat using your water. And, uh, and that is, uh, is a nice, safe way to, to distribute uh, BTUs throughout a, a large area and being able to use natural gas as your source heat. If, if you were trying to use um, the other uh, types of, uh, of furnace heaters um, or even the inline heaters, basically you need a natural gas line to every bin, which, which does um, increase uh, your safety and, and, and it does uh, make it a, a, a bigger hassle in, in trying to uh, uh, get heat to your bins. So, so that is one nice thing that you can distribute your heat using using water. Um, but again, when you look at these, you can see that there is potential for restriction as far as getting uh, air to the inlet of your fan. Make sure you keep that in mind. You can also see how you can get uh, heat to, to almost any bin um, just by, uh, by by laying out your hoses. Here's the last uh, 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 supplemental heater type that we'll be looking at. This is a, a hydronic heater. It's, it's something I've been developing with Wildey Egg Ventures for the last uh, about six years. This is basically a, a, a sized down version of the dry air system. It's a 400,000 BTU per hour heater. Um, th this is the only uh, heater that I actually found uh, an, an energy rating uh, as far as the uh, the, the heater efficiency and it's rated at 84 percent efficiency for this this heater and uh, and really the the nice thing about this size heater is that you can install it on almost any farm site and if there is natural gas at that site it's very unlikely that you will have to do any upgrades because it's only 400,000 BTUs it also gives you the uh, the luxury of being able to uh, move uh, heat to, to almost any bin in a bin yard, uh, a single point fuel connection, which is important uh, and an asset for natural gas. And it, it also um, uh, provides even, even a small heater like this, 400,000 BTU per hour. We can, we can quite easily drive 40 to 50,000 uh, bushels per month with this system. And, uh, and in most instances, that, that is enough for, uh, for, for a farm of, um, I don't know, two to 4,000 acres. Uh, once again, you can see that uh, you, you have the manifold. You can, you can feed four rads at once. And, and basically, it's the same system as a, uh, as a dry air. Uh, you, you basically have uh, just a slightly different rad uh, configuration. So that, uh, that summarizes um, the different types of, of, of supplemental heaters. And, and what you kind of can see is that there really isn't that difference, uh, big of a difference from one heater to the next. Um, efficiency is typically in that 80%, um, 70 to 80% is as good as it's going to get. 
Um, but what really um, makes the difference is the type of fuel. And uh, I wanna just walk through the, the, the fuel types and costs for, for the various fuels. Again, I'm doing it in, in a cost for 100,000 BTUs. Um, and uh, electricity is, is the most expensive. Uh, and at 15 cents per kilowatt hour, you're looking at about $4.28 for 100,000 BTUs. Gasoline, which isn't real common uh, to be used for supplemental heating, it's at a buck a liter, that's $3.05 for 100,000 BTUs. Diesel, which is, is one of the, the, the more popular fuels, it's 272 per 100,000 BTUs. And uh, propane at 55 cents a liter, and again, usually that price uh, changes depending on demand, and usually demand is highest at harvest. But at 55 cents a liter, you're looking at 229 per 100,000 BTUs. And, and the last fuel is natural gas, and uh, I used a price of seven dollars for GG. Um, I, I think it's probably at six or lower right now. But but so this is somewhat conservative. But that, that works out to about 74 cents per 100,000 BTUs. So you can see where fuel cost um, has a huge impact. Um, but, but one piece of the puzzle that's missing with this fuel cost is the carbon tax. Um, now with the carbon tax, you, you really want to be aware of, of how much additional costs you will see by burning the various fuels and, 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 uh, and what kind of tax you will have to pay. Electricity, basically electricity, the carbon tax is paid by the generator. So that is something that, that really isn't um, the farm. It doesn't impact the farmer uh, directly. Uh, so I, I didn't calculate it, even though it, it, it is there. Gasoline, um, with, with uh, carbon, we're, we're, we're generating in 100,000 BTUs. Uh, uh, when we burn 100,000 BTUs, we, we emit about 15.7 pounds of carbon. and uh, and that calculates out to about 21 cents per 100,000 BTUs currently. And, and in the future, it's going to go up to about 30 cents. Diesel, we're looking at about 16.1 pounds per 100,000 BTUs of, uh, of, of combustion. And that works out to about 22 cents per 100,000 BTUs currently and about 37 in the future. But um, as I'm sure you're all aware, Farm diesel fuel is exempt from the carbon tax. So that's just for information, um, what sort of, uh, how, how it it, uh, it lines up with the other fuels. Propane, 13.9 um, pounds uh, per 100,000 BTU of carbon. That's 19 cents currently, and, and in the future, it'll be bumping up to 32 cents. And natural gas, which is the, uh, the most uh, environmentally friendly fuel, it only is about 11.7 pounds of carbon per 100,000 BTU. And uh, that, that works out to 16 cents per 100,000 BTU currently, and 27 cents um, once, uh, once that tax rate bumps upwards. So, so that gives you, your, you know, the, imp, the amount of tax that you'd have to pay. And I just want to roll that into a, a total fuel cost. So uh, electricity is 428 per 100,000 gasoline. 341 with a 11.8 percent of that being carbon tax. Diesel is 272 and it's exempt from carbon tax. Propane is 260 per 100,000 BTU with 13.5 percent carbon tax. And natural gas is one dollar per 100,000 BTU with a whopping 35.1 percent carbon tax. And the main reason that that carbon tax is so high is because natural gas pricing is so crazy low. So, uh, so that, that gives you your, your comparative uh, all-in cost per 100,000 BTU for the various fuels. But uh, what, what, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna see, okay, ultimately I wanna have an efficiency of, of how much of your fuel cash expense is actually going into the grain mass. So this is basically trying to, to create a comparative for, for your, for your uh, uh, supplemental heaters, you look at thermodynamic efficiency, how much of your cash is wasted by heating the environment. This is basically saying how much cash is wasted not by heating the environment, but basically cash that is, is wasted by going into a boardroom, 
somewhere and and, uh, and and basically you're throwing cash away in a different manner. Now, what, what I've done is a cost efficiency. I've used natural gas as, as your 100% efficient because it is the lowest cost uh, fuel by, by quite a, an amount. And then when I look at propane and diesel, you're looking at a, a under 40% efficiency. So, so when you're burning propane or diesel, 40% is going into the grain mass and about 60% is going into the boardrooms or, 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 or supporting some business somewhere. When you look at gasoline and electricity, it's, it's even worse. It's about 30% efficient. And so you've got about 70% of waste compared to burning natural gas. So, so you can see how the, the fuel has a far bigger impact uh, fuel choice over as compared to the, the choice of your actual supplemental heater. Here's one additional view. This is basically looking at, at the point per bushel. With our IBD monitor, we, we've, uh, we've shown that you can get at two cents or less per point with natural gas. And, um, and if you do a real crude comparison, that means you're gonna have about five cents per point is as good as it's gonna get for propane and diesel and seven cents for gasoline and electricity. So if you want a, a super competitive, low cost on-farm drying, um, natural gas has to be your fuel. Uh, this is one last uh, uh, analysis. It shows 100,000 bushels. You're drying at five points. With natural gas, you're looking at about a $1,000 total cost. With propane or diesel, you're looking at $2,500. So it's an extra $1,500. Now, um, you know, in, in summary, I know that, uh, that, that it's easy for me to say you have to burn natural gas because I have heard, in talking to many farmers, Natural gas, natural gas is not an option, and uh, and and I really, uh, I, I mean that that drives me crazy because ultimately, um, I worked in the oil and gas industry the last 30 years here in Alberta. I'm 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 familiar with with a, the huge excess supply of natural gas in Alberta and in Saskatchewan, and the incredibly low prices that that the oil companies are getting paid for their their raw product, and um, and it just makes me crazy that farmers aren't seeing um, these low prices and I would love to hear from anyone who is having a hard time or, or finds it cost prohibitive to get natural gas to their yard site because uh, as far as I'm concerned we have to to go to the politicians and and, and we should be focusing on building a, a pipeline uh, for our farmers rather than trying to export this gas but uh, but but anyways I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that um, uh, as leave it there and uh, and ultimately that that really is um, the end of our webinar that that really breaks down all our components of in bin drying and, and it creates a simple simplistic view of, of, of what it takes to, to, to get an efficient in bin drying. Um, I welcome any uh, feedback uh, on, on our website uh, and, and and feel free to, to contact me or Kent by email or on our cell. Uh, we look forward to uh, to hearing for you and 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 uh, look forward to a, a really good harvest in the in the the month to come.